In the first video in the stereochemistry chapter, I talked about three systems of nomenclature. Small d, small l, corresponding to dextro and levorotatory, the plus isomer and the minus isomer, referring to the direction in which they bend plane polarized light. Capital R and capital S standing for rectus and sinister, which are ways of labeling chiral centers, asymmetric centers that are attached to four different carbon atoms. And then capital D and capital L, which I said were related to the Fisher projections. Of the simplest sugar, D was their alkali, where the D isomer is the one that had the OH group on the right and the L isomer had it on the left. But I didn't actually tell you what a Fisher projection was and explain how you can use a Fisher projection go back to a dashed wedge structure. So a Fisher projection is a way of labeling or of drawing a molecule so that everything is in the plane. Which obscures the chiral center, but makes it neater when you're writing molecules that have more chiral centers, like glucose, for example, which is a aldohexos has six carbons and four chiral centers, and the D isomer of glucose CHO group is in the plane of the board. And the 
CH2OH would be the complaint of Ford. The hydrogen that was on the left here is less than a year sort of back. And the OH group is on the right. And I thought that that way to the left rather than this way to the right, because that allows me to put the hydrogen back. And putting hydrogen back makes it easier for me to determine the stereo chemistry. So the hydrogen is the last priority. The OH group is number one. And this carbon outranks this carbon because it's bound to oxygen twice. This is what we have with oxygen. And up thus is the R stereo So D glyceraldehyde has the R stereo at its one chiral center. It happens that it's also plus glyceraldehyde. Dextro rotatory isomer. But that's not necessarily true of all B series sugars. Some B series sugars have negative rotations that are thus the small L micro rotatory isomer. In the case of D glucose, there are actually four chiral centers. Because all four of these carbons have four different substituents. It's possible to determine the chiral center directly from the Fischer projection once you've converted it into this bow tie system. By putting yourself behind the board and looking out at the hydrogen, we can determine that this oxygen is number one. This carbon that's attached to both oxygen and another carbon now ranks this carbon to be attached to oxygen, so the chain is number two. This would be number three, and you can see that this is an R stereocenter. At this point, when we're looking at stereocenter number four, right, the oxygen number one and the hydrogen number four, these are both CHOH groups that are attached to another carbon, so there's no difference yet. Right? Carbon three and carbon five are identical. But carbon two here is not identical to carbon six. Carbon two is attached to both oxygen and carbon. Carbon six is attached only to oxygen. So again, this chain outranks the other. This is another R stereo center. Right? The oxygen is number one. These are both CHOH groups. But then this carbon is attached to oxygen twice. This carbon is only attached to oxygen to the lower chain. And in that way, this is the test stereo center. And then finally, this carbon outranks this one because it's attached to oxygen twice. This is attached to oxygen and carbon. Two bonds to oxygen means one to oxygen and one to carbon. And so this is the higher priority. And this is the R stereo center. So, There are four stereo centers in D glucose. It's D glucose because stereo center number five has the OH on the right in the Fischer projection. And it happens that D glucose is dextro rotatory. Um, but again, not all of the D series sugars are dextro rotatory. There are several D series sugars that are micro rotatory. The reason I bring up some more uh, Fischer projection work here is because I want to talk about the process of separating enantiomers, which is referred to as resolution. And we will have to use a trick of some sort. So 
to allow us to do that separation. And the trick we will use is to exploit the fact that diastereomers, which are not related to objects and non superimposed with mirror image, not related to object and mirror image at all, diastereomers do have different physical properties. So if we can take a mixture of enantiomers and convert them into diastereomers somehow, then we have compounds that are likely to have different boiling points, different solubility properties, different polarity, could be separated on uh, from the product. So let's consider a chiral amine. molecule that has a single chiral center. This would be the S isomer. Hydrogen is number one. The carbon is attached to another carbon is number two. The carbon that's not attached to another carbon is number three. Hydrogen is number four. So that would be the S isomer. And that could draw the corresponding R isomer. Hydrogen bus is going to be going back on this carbon. And the 
way to get out. And this car could get away from me going back. Um, so that's the eclipse confirmer. That's not the most stable confirmation. I'd now like to rotate 180 degrees. So I'm flopping it 90 degrees to get it into the plane before. And then I'm rotating 180 degrees around this CC bond. You can see the weight is going down. So that I have a fully scattered molecule. That won't affect the relative position of the orientation between the hydrogen on the right hand carpet. But it will affect the relative position of the OA through the hydrogen on carbon number two. The hydrogen of plus and the OA of plus rotating the back and the cap. Now I have a drawing of the molecule that makes it easy for me to determine whether the stereocenters are R or S because both the hydrogen and the back. The OA group is number one. The carbon that's attached to oxygen three times, once by a double bond and once by a single bond, outranks the carbon that's attached to oxygen only once. So this is the due to the priority two. This carbon is the priority three. And number four is there at the S stereo center. Again, the OA group one, the carbon that's attached three times to oxygen. It's more important than the carbon that's only attached one time to oxygen, once to carbon. So this is number two. The chain is number three. And that is also the S stereocenter. Because this molecule is quite symmetrical, if we had one R stereocenter and one S stereocenter, if we had both OH groups on the right, that would be a meso compound. And meso tartaric acid is, in fact, also available. So D minus tartaric acid or L plus tartaric acid are single pure stereoisomers, both commercially available and inexpensive. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to react my mixture of amines with my chiral auxiliary, my D minus tartaric acid, or my SS isomer tartaric acid. I'm going to redraw over here. Two O8 groups up. To make it simpler to draw, I'm not going to show the hydrogen. I need two hydrogens off, but obviously, up, it must be a hydrogen going back. So I'm going to react these with my chiral auxiliary, my SS tartaric acid, that's 3S, 2,3, hydroxy, acid, or D. So I still have the R stereocenter here. 
And it doesn't affect the stereocenter in carbon 2 and carbon 3 of my tartaric acid either. So I have a salt where two of the stereocenters are the S stereocenter, the ones from the tartaric acid, and one of the stereocenters is the R stereocenter, the one but I could also take off the OH group with the nitrogen from the S isomer to generate the other salt. And because it was a single pure stereoisomer of tartaric acid, has the same SS configuration on carbon 2 and carbon 3 of the tartaric acid, but now it also has the S stereocenter on the amine. So these are enantiomers. But these salts are diastereic. different solubilities in water. So I can separate those. It may take several cycles of recrystallizing it slightly enrich it in R in the crystals and slightly enrich it in S in solution and then evaporate them and recrystallize again. But I will eventually succeed in getting these two salts, which are diastereomerics, diastereomeric to each other, separated in individual flasks. We are using the property of diastereomers having different physical properties. So we're taking the two enantiomers of the amine, which have identical physical properties and thus are not separable, and we're converting them into things that now are diastereomers instead of enantiomers that are thus separable. Once I've separated them, the question is now how to regenerate the pure amine. And if I treat that with dilute, say, six molar, Hydroxide, the hydroxide will take off the hydrogen from the amine and instead of having the ammonium salt in my tartaric acid, I will now have sodium salt in my tartaric acid and I'll have water and I'll have my free amine back.
separating the layers and then evaporating off the uh, organic layer, the ethyl acetate, the other suitable solvent that's invisible with water, the solvent of beans, will allow me to get the S amine from this extraction and the pure R amine from that extraction. Since tartaric acid is cheap and plentiful, I probably won't bother recovering the tartaric acid for reuse, but it would be possible to recover the tartaric acid for reuse. And in some cases, the chiral auxiliary you use might be quite expensive. There's a compound called Mosher's acid, which is much more expensive than tartaric acid, by simply adding HCl. You add aqueous HCl, remember it's actually a rubbing ion. Or aqueous HCl, just as you used in the extraction. The carboxylate ion will equip the, the water, or the hydronium ion, rather, to generate a neutral compound. Now we're getting soluble. And generate sodium chloride as the product. So you can separate your chiral auxiliary back into an organic layer and evaporate it down to recover the chiral auxiliary. So it's fairly simple in practice, or in principle on board. Right? We simply mix together a solution of our chiral auxiliary, the tartaric acid, S, S isomer to D minus isomer tartaric acid, to make dihydrogenated salts, we crystallize them apart, and then we take each of those separate crystalline salts and treat the sodium hydroxide to generate the neutral amine, which we can extract into our DNA layer, and then treat it with ACL to generate the neutral acid which we can then recover again by extracting into the organic layer and getting rid of the sodium chloride byproduct. In practice, it's more difficult because the crystallization doesn't necessarily go very smoothly and certainly isn't likely to happen uh, to 100% in one recrystallization but in multiple crystallizations. And this is only applicable, right, the separation of tartaric acid, to compounds that are bases, amines that can be made into salts. If I have a mixture of two enantiomers of a chiral carboxylic acid, I could use a chiral auxiliary, which was a mean that I could get into a form, and strychnine and leucine, which are both rat poisons, are both available as pure stereoisomers, the pure E or the pure L stereoisomer of strychnine. Those structures are much more complicated, which is why I can use them as my example here. The other possible method is if your compounds are not diastereomers, then they're not separable on a ordinary HDLC column or chromatography column because the enantiomers have identical solubility and polarity properties. But it is possible to have Chiral molecules attached to silicon gel such that the chromatography column itself becomes chiral. If the chromatography column itself is chiral, the enantiomers will interact with it differently. This is similar to the way enzymes in your body react specifically with one enantiomer of 
compound, right? So your body metabolizes D sugars, makes D sugars, and L amino acids in mammalian systems. Enantiomers interact differently with chiral molecules, enzymes are chiral. Enantiomers will interact differently with a chiral stationary phase. And if that's true, they will have different retention values. Which means that a chiral HPLC column will separate two enantiomers, or a chiral GC column will separate your two enantiomers. Now, the problem, of course, for a large scale separation is your HPLC columns are typically quite small, and you're usually working with very delicate solutions. To scale this up would require a very large HPLC column, and these chiral modified chromatography columns, these chiral silicon gels, are extremely expensive. So to do this on a preparative scale requires you to have the kind of money that a pharmaceutical company has, rather than the kind of money that a uh, small undergraduate liberal arts college has. We do have one chiral HPLC column in the department, but it's a small analytical column with only a 4.6 millimeter ID, and so it's not practically useful for separating large molecules. And we have chiral GC columns as well, but capillary gas chromatography is only suitable for you know, separating uh, microgram to nanogram quantity of material. So it's a diagnostic tool for us, but not a separation tool. Our, our pharmaceutical companies can afford to make large chiral APLC columns, especially if it's for one particular separation. And so chiral chromatography using chiral stationary phases becomes another reasonable way to separate the molecules. Another way that's sometimes used to separate the enzymes called kinetic resolution. Find out 
first if the enzyme is actually going to cleave the ester period, for which you probably use a cheap um, racemic mixture of the methyl 2 hydroxyquinoate And then you have to determine whether or not it will cleave them at appreciably different rates. Once you've cleaved them, this one can be made into a salt. But there are there is a lot more interest and there are a lot more enzymes that 